thank you and praise you. And as we open up your word right now, let it shape us and fill us in the ways that you would move us to live into the fullness of your kingdom. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're continuing um, our series on the Sermon on the Mount. We're jumping into something that I'm calling hot button topics. Hot button topics. We've uh, just let's let's rehearse a little bit where we've been. We started with the Beatitudes, kind of the foundation of of the kingdom of of Jesus is asking us to look at this this revolution of these gorillas of grace that are seeing the world in a different way, a way that turns upside down our values and what we think we understand. That foundation moves into that picture of those folks of the kingdom being salt and light in the world. And then we get into the ethics, the ethics of the kingdom that's moving from the inside out. Not a law that's on the outside in, but the inside out, the fullness of what God intended. Spiritual disciplines, we followed that up with with a look at, at giving, of prayer, of fasting. And today, for two weeks, we look at wealth. And then after, um, after Easter, because we're going to have an interlude there for our Lenten series, after Easter, we'll look at hot-button topics of homosexuality and universalism. Okay, so buckle your seatbelts. You ready to go? Here's what Jesus has to say about wealth from the sixth chapter of Matthew. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. They have so little, and they have so much joy. They have so little, and they have so much joy. How many times have you heard that? Team going to the DR? I guarantee you, somebody will come back and say they have nothing, but they have so much joy. They're filled with so much life. It was said last week as I was in India, a very wealthy farmer from Michigan encountered these kids full of joy, and he said they have so little. And they have so much joy. It reflects a worldview, doesn't it? A worldview that says our joy or our happiness comes from what we have. Now, I know most of us here would say money can't buy happiness. We understand that. But we would also probably say if you have no money, it's tough to be happy. Jesus takes on our worldview today in this section of the Sermon on the Mount. It's consistent with what He's been doing on this journey so far with us. He's laying out this picture of of how His disciples are called to live in this world, living in the kingdom of heaven. I, I hope that you've heard that clearly. That the kingdom of heaven is not pie in the sky by and by, but when Jesus came, He said the kingdom of heaven is amongst you. Is amongst you. It's breaking out. It's here. It's now. It will be then and there, but it is here and now. And, And He's laying out a vision for how you live in this world that says it's either or. Now, I know if you're like me, 
You'd like it to be both and, wouldn't you? You know? I mean, I'd like to have treasure on earth and treasure in heaven. But Jesus lays out either or. I'd like to have a worldview that kind of sees it both ways. Sees some of the picture of the kingdom of God. Sees some of the picture of the kingdom of this world. And kind of combines them two in a really comfortable way. And Jesus says your eye either sees light or your eye sees darkness. And, and finally, you know, it's either God or wealth. Either or. Challenging words to us this morning. Challenging words that, that I want you to leave this time that we have together these next 15 minutes or so. Or so. <laughs> Taking an assessment of where is your heart, where is your eye, and where is your wallet. Those three things. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your eye can see light or your eye can see darkness. You cannot serve God and wealth. Is this a hot button topic, wealth today? What do you think? You know, I I mean, whenever I preach on money, somebody always comes out in the fellowship hall and they says, Sometimes, you know, sometimes they say good job, but usually they say, wow, that's a tough topic to preach on, money. It's, it's not that tough. It's not that tough. And Jesus talked about money more than any other topic in the Gospels except for the kingdom of God. And you can say when he's talking about money, he is talking about the kingdom of God, and you can certainly see that here. Uh, Cheryl told me that today was Friendship Sunday, where kids were invited to uh, invite friends to Sunday school. So we knew we might have some visitors here. And I said, well, I'm preaching on money. And she said, oh, maybe we should do it some other time. (laughs) And I will say this today, I'm preaching on money next week too. Okay? Okay? Take a picture here, Jenny. We want to see who doesn't come back next week because they heard he's preaching on money. Somehow, it gets us nervous. It gets us uptight because we recognize in our worldview, money is very important to us. And so it's it's a hot-button topic individually, but I think it's also a hot-button topic in our world. Our world is, is whacked out in regards to wealth. The top 1% of the world's wealthiest people control half of all the wealth in the world. And the gap just keeps growing in this country and in the world. Spending time in India was was really, really interesting because um, I went, I combined two trips. One was with Mission India, which is this organization that funds church planters, Children's Bible Clubs and Adult Literacy Programs in India. Very, very exciting organization. I'm so charged by it. And then the other was to meet with our missionary, Pastor Ebenezer. Uh, and, and last week I was preaching in his church. He had me preaching in every church in India, I feel like. You know, he, he didn't tell me I was going to do this, but like we're driving to this first church, and, uh, and he says, you're going to share the gospel here, okay? All right. Well, we went to five churches that day. So like I'm preaching a different message at every church. Um, but, but I sort of had the contrast, okay? So, so the Mission India trip was with wealthy donors. I mean, big time heavy hitters. People that run foundations and those kind of things. So my friend Todd, Todd Van Eck, who, who is the president of Mission India in the United States, said, we've got to go upscale when we go to India because... It just wouldn't work if we were staying in hostels and, and one-star hotels in India. So, so we stayed at four-star hotels, some hotels I would never stay at with Kathy. You know, it's like just above my, my pay grade, I'll say. Uh, but the irony was in each one of these hotels, we had buffets. 
So I ate more food in India than I eat in the United States of America. You know, I usually don't eat breakfast. There, we had a breakfast buffet, Indian food. We had a lunch buffet. We're eating again. We had a dinner buffet. We're eating again. And I think you understand the irony of this, that we're at a buffet at the Ramada Inn in Calcutta, one of the poorest cities in the world, where around us is just squalor and sewage and desperation, and we're eating in a four-star hotel at a buffet. It's a little picture of our world, isn't it? And we don't know what to do about it. We don't know what to do about it, how to handle that. Like, when your mother would say, finish the food on your plate, think of all those starving children in India, and you would say, well, go ahead, send my mashed potatoes to India. I don't care. It doesn't really make sense to pack up your mashed potatoes in a little box and send them to India. And I understand that if I snuck a plate out of the buffet and took it to, um, to somebody that was hungry, it, it's not going to change the world. But I think what we start to see when we start to look at these issues that Jesus is raising before us, we start to get a sense of what it means to live in the kingdom of God in a world of such disparity. Because the kingdom of earth says it's about what you can take and hold on for yourself. It's about being at that buffet and eating all you can. The kingdom of heaven is asking us to see the world in a different way. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Now whenever I've heard this text, you know, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, I've, I've always thought of this text as talking about the reward I get when I die and finally stand before God and, and God says, wow, you know, you gave a lot of money to the church. You, know, you invested in missionaries. You did all those things. So now you'll get reward in heaven. But from this teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, I believe it's, it's helping us to understand something differently. And that is tied in with the fact that Jesus isn't talking about pie in the sky by and by. But there's ways that you and I can invest in the kingdom of heaven right now you know to understand the ways that we use our generosity to change the world because because the vision of what God's asking you to do is to is to make down here look more like up there and, and we recognize this disparity with uh Wealthy Westerners eating at a buffet while the world outside is starving is not what the kingdom of God looks like. I don't know if you remember, but um, a number of years ago when we were sending a team to Niger, I had been to Niger in West Africa, one of the poorest countries in the world, and I said, man, it would be so nice if you could just walk through a poverty-stricken country like this and that every child begging to you, you could just give them a dollar. And, and I had the vision for this church that we would raise nickels for Niger. You remember that? We had a, a thing out there. And we sent our mission team there. And, uh, and we had Leslie McConnell giving out dollars. We had people that were going giving out dollars. And our missionary, Tom Johnson, said, please, don't do that. You know? Do you understand what you're doing when you do that. So a little kid who that day has gotten some dollars from begging comes home and has more money in his hand than his father's had from working all day. What does that do to the family? Some of the kids that you give money to are kids that uh, later on get robbed by older boys that know they're getting money. So to just... Go out and try to address it in that way is not investing in the kingdom of heaven. It's just perpetuating, perpetuating the chaos on earth. What Tom Johnson said to us, he said, if you want to change the world, he said, educate a girl. 
He said, educate a girl. Because that affects the family more than educating the man, even. That affects the family, and that changes the world. See, what I'm saying is, I, I believe that's an investment in the kingdom of heaven. I had a 14-hour flight. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I'm still, I was up, I was up, actually, I think I was up at 12.30 this morning, and I've been awake since then. So if this doesn't make sense, blame it on the jet lag, okay? Um, but I watched movies after movie after movie. One of the movies was I Am Malayla. You know that movie? Malayla was the Pakistani girl that was shot by the Taliban because she stood up and said, girls need to be educated. And so radical and revolutionary was that idea to the Taliban that they sought to gun down this young junior high girl. Did they silence her? No. They gave her a platform that finally led to the Nobel Peace Prize that she got, and she's now traveling the world saying, educate the kids. The kingdom of heaven. So, so here's what I want you to think about. When Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I want you to put your money in those things, those treasures where your heart, that make your heart grateful. Grateful. And put those things in, those things that break your heart. Find those things. I'm asking you to be strategic today in your generosity, in the way you live. Not just saying how crazy it is that we have buffets in Calcutta when people are starving. But to start living into a vision of what you see God doing through you. What you're passionate about. What breaks your heart, first of all. You know, one of the, the reasons I think that, that we have so much success, like with our Thanksgiving offering for beds in the name of Christ, is people recognize that in our community, we don't want anybody to be without a bed. People strategically love to give in that way. But I'm asking each of us here, to start giving and living into that vision of the kingdom of heaven in putting our heart in those places that break our heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, you, you with me? You know? So, so if hunger is your issue, find a way to strategically put your treasure addressing that. Where you get a grateful heart. I believe that's why the, the Christians have always said the place that starts is the church. This is the place that you come week in and week out and kind of get that lens on that recalibrates your vision for seeing the kingdom of heaven. So your home community, your church, let that strategically be supported by the money that you give. We're going to keep talking about this, so come back next week. You'll get more of that. But the second thing I want to look at, the second question is, where's your eye? Where's your eye? Because if you look at this text on the Sermon on the Mount, it's a little strange, isn't it? Jesus is talking about where your treasure is, and then Jesus is talking about you can't uh, serve God and money. And in the middle, there's this weird statement that says the eye is the lamp of the body. If through that eye comes light, you see light. If through that eye sees darkness, you see darkness. A lot of commentators struggle with this. It's like, did Matthew just stick this into the sermon? Or maybe Jesus didn't get a lot of sleep that night and he kind of lost his train of thought for a second and was a little confused? Do you think that was it? You can blame that on me, but let's not blame that on Jesus, okay? But I think it's totally consistent with what Jesus is saying. Because, because the way we see the world... The way we see the world says, how can they have joy if they have so little, is a way that says, we see the world through the eyes of consumption. And, and, and that is the way that we see the world, that, that we, we value ourselves and people by how much we have. We see the world in our, our worry about not having enough. I am talking to the richest people in the world today. Look at your neighbor, or you're maybe sitting next to your spouse. Look at the person behind you and say, you are the wealthiest person 
in the world. One of the wealthiest persons in the world. Did you know the World Bank says that if you make $10,000 in your household, $10,000, you are making more money than 84% of the world's population. If you make $50,000, anybody here making $50,000? You truly are the 1% of the world's population. But that's not the way we feel, is it? Do you feel that wealthy today? Did what I say to you just say, oh, I don't need to worry anymore. I'm in good shape, man. I, I just have so much. No, because we always tend to look at who's above us, right? We're not so concerned about the 84% that's below us. We're trying to say, well, who's above us? Like, I sat on that plane cramped into these little seats in economy. I mean, they're getting smaller and small. I don't think I'm getting any, I'm not getting any taller. I may be getting larger, but, you know. And then you walk out and you go through first class and you see these beds and you see like all this food that was sitting there. You kind of go, why am I not sleeping there? Why did I have to sleep there? You know what I'm saying? That, that your eyes get distorted by what the world defines as, as the way that we should live. You know I'm excited about next week, right, Tony? Okay, I'm excited about, about the Super Bowl and the Denver Broncos. I watched the Pittsburgh game yesterday, Dave. Sorry about that, you know. Steeler fans here, you know. I watched, uh, I watched the Patriot game first, you know. But... But isn't our world whacked out? What's going to happen next week is crazy, folks. The billions and billions of dollars that are spent on a game where young men actually are sacrificing their future life. I'm sensitive to traumatic brain injuries now. And when you see the hits that happen and the money that's put forward, there's darkness in our world. Can you imagine if we started to see things in a different way? If we started to say, here the spokesman for Papa John's pizza is not Peyton Manning, but it is somebody that works with Doctors Without Borders that's pouring his life into other people in that way. Or here's a missionary that's sharing the good news of the gospel to people in India. Here's an adult literacy volunteer that has taken 50 women who can't read and teaching them to read the stories of Jesus, teaching them to understand basics of finances, teaching them to understand how you plant trees and build a village that's healthy and sustainable. Don't you think that should be the Super Bowl that we celebrate in our world? But instead, we pay ridiculous amounts of money to athletes that play a game. And with all due respect to Pepsi, Mike, Pepsi will spend how much money next week on a halftime show to try and get you to drink their drink? It's crazy. So Jesus is inviting us to see the world through the light of the kingdom. When I, when I preached there, I was like a rock star. I was like a rock star. I mean, people actually were asking me to sign autographs. It's never happened to me. If you want to make me happy today, you know, you can ask me to sign an autograph when you leave church today. But the only reason... I was a rock star, was because I was white, was I was coming from the West, and, and I was unique in that culture. I mean, the rock stars for me were those women leading the adult literacy programs, were those volunteers that were serving, were those church planters that were planting a small, struggling church, but seeing the gospel celebrated in joy. So, the second thing I ask you, 
Where's your eye? What are you looking at for the values that define who you are, that shape your life? Because if we're on this cycle of consumption, it's a never-ending cycle. John D. Rockefeller, the famous millionaire, was asked the question, how much money is enough? You know what his answer was? One more dollar than I have. Isn't that sick? But it's the way we all think. Like, oh, if I just had, if I just had ten thousand more dollars, I'd be okay. You know, then I'd, I'd find myself uh, not spending more than I'm making. But we, we live in a crazy cycle of saying I've got to consume more and more. So I ask you, how is your eyes? Is it focused on the next purchase, that new car, that raise that you're hoping to have? Or can you see the blessings that are already there? The wealth that you already have? The final either or is God or wealth. You cannot serve both, says Jesus. Either or. Martin Luther is known for saying there are three conversions for the Christian. The conversion of the mind the conversion of the heart, and the conversion of the wallet. And the third may be the most difficult. And and that's the invitation that I want to give you today. And that's the invitation we'll look at next week as well. I don't have time to go through all of this this morning, but, but the response to this is not a call to guilt, but it's a call to gratitude. A call to living a life of giving that invests in the kingdom of God, that sees an alternative that God has for us, that gives in a way that is strategic. I've given you a card today, and we had a lot of debate about this card. Did everybody get one of those cards? True Treasure Card 2016. It says don't sign it, but actually, don't worry about it. I mean, you're not going to... You're not going to hand that in or anything. This this is just an invitation for you to put on those glasses of light for your life. First, to start with your blessing. And some people say, well, you know, is this before taxes or is this after taxes? You know, is this my net income? Is this my gross income? You know, those are the wrong questions to ask. Just what's God blessed you with? What do you anticipate? This is a good time to do it. This is uh, tax season right now. You can take a look at that. Of that, how much am I giving to investing in the, in the kingdom of heaven in this world? Take a look at your, your charity. What, what are you doing that's making a difference for the kingdom of God? And then finally, just an invitation to say, what am I giving to Hopewell? What, what is, is the blessing that's being poured out there. As you look at that card, and as I said, you're not going to hand it in. It's just something you can stick it in your checkbook. You can stick it in your Bible. You can throw it away. You know, that's between you and God. It's it's not up to me. But I'm I'm inviting you to see the world in a different way. And and if you've never done this, um, I'm inviting you to, to give with these three P's in mind, Okay. You can write them down on the back of your card if you want. But, but what I'm asking you to do, that's why I gave you that card, is to, is to uh, premeditate about this. Think about this before it happens. Because so much of our giving is response. You know, somebody gives a heart-wrenching story. We don't have enough money, but we try to give whatever we can in that way. But start, as Paul says, with the first fruits. And, and, and Paul says, consider what you will give. So think about it. Premeditate. Make it a priority. The first fruits is about a priority. Paul told the Corinthian church to set aside something on the first day of the week so that when he came, the offerings wouldn't have to be taken up then. They would just be um, available already because you know how that can build up if you, if you let it be set aside. And, and the other thing I encourage you is to look at a percentage. You know, what percentage? Because, because as that wealth increases, that percentage can increase with it. It's not a dollar figure, but a percentage. You know, the church from the Old Testament has traditionally used the tithe, 10%. But, but really, the invitation for you is to give. And, and 
at the start may look like an astronomical figure, but, but take a look and say, God, I commit this to the work of your kingdom. Jesus is looking for people who live in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is inviting us to that journey because God has given us so much. He's given us His Son. So our whole lives are called to be returned in gratitude for the grace that we have been shown in Jesus Christ. I did experience great joy in India. In fact, this outfit, Shawani or whatever, maybe called something different in Pakistan. I'm not even sure what it's called. You know, the host family of Pastor Ebenezer, they wanted to take me out and buy this. And I'm like, no. I'll probably never wear it again. You know? I don't want that gift. It's a waste of money. But for them, it was an expression of joy and gratitude. So I wear it because I see the light that comes through that. And it's funny because they wanted to buy Kathy um, a sari. A sari, you know, a half of the midriff is kind of exposed there. I don't think Kathy would go for that too much. And I'm like, no, that's great. You know, thanks so much. And, and you know what they did? When I was going to the airport, they got my bag and they slipped an outfit in for her into my bag. So I'm there in the hotel opening up my bag and I'm like, wow. You know, I'm just, I'm just so blessed. It, it's not, imagine if some guest came to me. Would I ever say, let me buy you a Brooks Brothers suit? Let me, let me, I insist on buying you a suit. I don't live that way. I don't live that way. But I want to live that way. I want to live that way in gratitude, in generosity, investing in the kingdom of heaven. I, I I hope you want it too. I hope this isn't a hot button topic for you. I don't think, I hope you don't walk out of here sweating or saying, oh man, that guy really pounded me today. Because I think ultimately Jesus is talking about joy. And we're going to see that a lot more next week as we hear those words, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. You know, you worry about so much that you don't need to worry about. So um, today, my friends, I invite you to the kingdom to see the great joy that is yours in Christ. Let us pray. Lord, open our eyes to the blessings that are around us. We confess that we see a world of scarcity and we're afraid that we don't have enough. And yet, You have said that we have everything that we need in Jesus Christ. I just pray, Lord, that You open our eyes to the light that You revealed in Him. And that we reflect that in, in radical generosity. Radical generosity of giving gifts to the Kingdom of Heaven. Giving gifts in strategic ways. Supporting the ministry of the Kingdom of God through our church. Supporting the ministry of the Kingdom of God through organizations that we're passionate about. But Lord, our, our souls are at stake here. Because it's either or. It's not serving wealth and God together. It's serving one or the other. So if we've been gifted with wealth, as Paul tells Timothy, let those who have wealth use it wisely. If we are struggling right now, Lord, I pray that even in our financial struggles, we begin first by seeking Your kingdom and giving. So we pray that this isn't a hot button topic for us today, but this is a topic that we see a little more clearly what you are calling us to as citizens of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.